Hello, everyone. We're going to wait a couple minutes to let everyone join the Zoom. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I am Christy Sullivan. As you know, may or may not know, I'm the secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. Um, welcome to our November webinar presented by ASCCT and USTIF. You can see our websites on the screen there. Feel free to check out our websites and learn about what we have going on and also becoming a member to support activities like the webinar series. The webinar is recorded and the recording will be posted on the ASCCT website a few days from now. And in the webinar platform, you can ask questions of the presenter using the Q&A feature uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. There will be a Q&A, or maybe at the top of your screen too, either one. There will be also a Q&A period after the presentation is finished. Add your questions at any time though, as they occur to you and other participants can see your questions and vote on the ones they wanna hear the answer to as well. We've also enabled closed captions and you can turn them on or off in the toolbar according to your preference. And finally, please say hello and let us know where you're joining from. You might realize that I have a different background this time. I am actually uh, attending a meeting in Paris this week. So I will, I'm joining you from the other side of the pond, as they say. So just a couple of really quick introductions. Um, uh, pieces of in, pieces of information. First of all, the ESTIV uh, Annual Congress is going to be in Prague next year, June of 2024. So please head on over to the ESTIV website and find out about that and register to join that meeting. The ASCCT 2024 meeting has also just been announced, so please save the dates in your calendar. It's going to be October 22nd through the 24th in Research Triangle Park area in North Carolina. We hope you will join us again. Uh, and if you have joined us before, and even if you haven't, we hope you will join. We are going to have um, session and CE proposal options for submission. Those are going to open in uh, earlier in next year. And you can also join the planning committee if you like. Please give us an email if you want to help plan the meeting. So I also wanted to let you know that we have a couple of more webinars coming up before the end of the new year. We have one later this month with Joe Niffler, also from Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research on cell painting. And we have um, a collaboration with the Japanese Society for Alternatives to Animal Experiments, JSAAE. We're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Masaki Nishikawa from the University of Tokyo. And so you can register for those, both of those webinars on our website. So today I will get to the topic now after I introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Bita Escher is a professor in the Department of Cell Toxicology at Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. She pioneered the field of water quality assessment by addressing complex mixtures of chemical pollutants using in vitro bioassays, and has turned more recently to application of these tools in human biomonitoring and ass assessing the exposome. Dr. Escher obtained her PhD in 1995 and her habilitation in 2002 at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, and is head of the Department of Cell Toxicology at Helmholtz Center. She's also a professor at the Eberhard Karls University at Tübingen, 
and she holds honorary professorships at the University of Queensland and Griffith University in Australia, and is also a lecturer at ETH in Zurich. Dr. Escher is gonna be talking about assessing uh, mixtures um, and helping to set effect-based trigger values in water quality assessment. So Beata, I will give you the floor now. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And so I've, while you were talking, I screened the um, participants and I also saw that um, Re Wingard is here and she actually invited me and facilitated me to speak to you today. And also SDF is new to me, but I will come to Prague because it's not very far from Leipzig. And so if you come to Prague, consider stopping by Leipzig, which is not quite as nice, um, but not far away. And um, so otherwise I don't know SDF so well, but I've seen quite a few people in the audience um, who know me a little bit. And so very warm welcome to those who know me and my work, but even warmer welcome to those who haven't heard about um, water quality monitoring. And, and um, what's important about that, I, I understand a lot of you are in chemical risk assessment. So I thought I'm giving you a little bit of a background. And a lot of that work um, that we've done in water quality monitoring and application of effect-based um, tools um, has been done in together with um, Peter Neal, both of us um, for many years at the University of Queensland. Um, and she's now at Griffith University and I'd like to acknowledge her. A lot of this effect-based trigger value work is really a group effort. Um, I could name at least 50 people, but they're also co-authors of the individual papers, but P Peter is really sticking out. And so um, she also approved of this presentation and she'll actually be talking about that at SOT next, um, next spring. Okay, so the type of test batteries that we are using for water quality assessment um, are very much anchored in the adverse outcome pathway concept. And so I'm not presenting here a N adverse outcome pathway, but kind of this reasoning going from toxicokinetics to the cellular toxicity pathways to the adverse outcomes comes in a few of the critical molecular initiating and key events. And so we have then assays that are indicative and they're mostly reported gene assays of um, some sort of activation of um, toxicokinetics. So um, PXR, pregnant X receptor, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, gamma and aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Down here are um, the most popular ones for water quality assessment. Um, hormone receptors, especially estrogen receptor, but also androgen, glucocorticoid, progesterone, and thyroid receptor um, have played a vital role. When it comes to surface water, also um, if you have um, insecticides, then acetylcholine esterase inhibition is one of the examples of inhibition of enzymes that is quite relevant. Sorry, my circle moved a bit too far to the left. For intermediate effects, DNA, DNA A damage, AIMS test is one of the most popular in the past, has been the most popular in the past for um, these type of endpoints. And last but not least, we also have stellar stress responses, such as the P53 adaptive stress response for to geodotoxicity or the oxidative stress response um, mediated by NIF2. And most recently, we have also started to introduce more imaging-based assays and have, um, um, have first experiences that, for instance, neurotoxicity or mitochondrial toxicity. And in all cases, there's also cytotoxicity in specific cell lines. In the field of ecotoxicology, you also have organism responses because there are quite a few assay systems that are legally not um, animal tests such as algal growth inhibition or daphnia immobilization. And in Europe, even the fish embryo toxicity is considered an alternative model. I'm not going to focus on that today, so I'll stick to the cell models um, um, because I figured that would probably be most interesting for you. These applications of in vitro assays for water quality assessment are, have really been popular basically starting around the turn of the century. 
And so this is the number of studies that applied in vitro tools in cell-based assay for water quality assessment um, with studies that had at least three different um, endpoints. Otherwise, of course, the number would be astronomical, but had this battery thinking, I want to have a comprehensive assessment of the water quality. And so this has really increased absolutely tremendously. And in 2012, we wrote a book on what we thought the, a pretty explosive field, field, but already in 2021, we wrote the second edition because the, um, the number of publications has really increased um, a lot. And this is just a summary. Um, there's a few studies that have used a lot of bioassays, um, um, a large number, but a, quite a majority of studies use between three and let's say six or seven essays. And they come from these different areas. So sometimes, of course, especially in drinking water, you're interested in disinfection byproducts. So you look at, at that stress response and reactive toxicity. And then of course, there's numerous studies like this one in wastewater where people are really interested in hormone effects. But very often you want to have a comprehensive view on the water quality. And so people combine tests from different areas of the um, adverse outcome pathway. And there's even more essays than the ones that we have in the book because um, sometimes you have an interesting endpoint. You think there's interesting chemicals or there's environmental pollutants that might trigger it, but there is no effect um, when you test water samples repeatedly. And then that's kind of not taken in into, into the test batteries. And so while there is not really a consensus movement, what to add when you do water quality assessment, Implicitly, there, there's kind of these the range of essays that are into endpoints that are introduced to you. But behind each one of them are, of course, several um, different cell types and several different essay types. And they all go from um, kits where you just buy division arrested cells and you run your sample all the way through to um, what I will show you a little bit um, high throughput um, assessment. And the the the, the the nice thing and the reason why we are using cell-based assays for water quality monitoring, because they are capturing the mixture effect of all the chemicals we extract. Of course, it's dependent on our extraction method, but whatever we get out is a typically a complex mixture. And the general wisdom is that mixtures are complex, challenging, and unpredictable. And what I want to show you today is that's not necessarily the case. When we look into environmental mixtures, yes, we do have thousands of chemicals. And we know this because if we do a non-targeted analysis, we have 10, 20,000 peaks. And that's only the chemicals that are ionizable in the, in the mass spect spectrometer. So um, possibly there's even more ones. There are very low concentrations. So alone, most of the chemicals would not cause an effect. Um, which, um, um, but together, they can act and elicit a mixture effect. And so when we, when we work at this low end of the concentration scale, then our dose response curve, so we have also um, dose response curves, concentration is, has no units here, but you can actually, when you have water, you, uh, your units are relative enrichment factors, and you maybe enrich your sample up to a hundred times, and then you see these dose response curves. But by the time you go into the range of the original water sample, very often, unless it's really a polluted wastewater um, treatment plant influent or so, but usually you don't exceed 30% um, uh, of the effect. And then at that low level, your dose response curve is actually quite linear. And these reported gene assays can resolve pretty much um, all the way down. I mean, it's not very robust here. I have quite a little bit of variability. Um, and so the EC10 is not necessarily um, a, a, a low act yet, but we, we get pretty robust curves at that low end. And so we have a very simplified way of looking at concentration response curves. And once we have linear concentration response curves, and this is just an artificial example on a 10 component mixture, and then you just um, compute the prediction for the, con uh, the mixture toxicity model of concentration addition, which typically holds for compounds with the same mode of action or independent action. 
which is for compounds with strictly different mode of action, what you see is actually up to 10, possibly even 20%, the predictions between concentration addition and independent action aren't different. Um, and the whole thing stays pretty much linear, which makes prediction of many, many components in, some, in a mixture at very low effect levels very simple. So taking that all together, if you have if you have very low levels, and that's what you have when you have a, a, a decent quality water, then concentration addition is equal independent action, and then you can predict mixture effects um, quite easily. So actually, complex mixtures at low effect level are very well predictable. And um, you have, I mean, this is kind of, you will probably say, say oh, what is she telling us? That's, um, that's not true. Complex mixtures are complex. That's the problem is we don't, we very often don't have the single chemical um, effect data for thousands of chemicals, but we've shown with up to 20, 30 compounds. Um, and at the moment I'm actually mixing um, chemicals for our, for our panoramics project up to 25 chemicals. We're moving up in the, in the numbers to get eventually reach um, really high numbers. Um, once you manage and you have the single chemical data, then things get very robust and, and um, it's really rewarding. I was also evaluating mixture effects yesterday and you are just sitting there and said, oh, this works. I was sitting in the train and so a student was sitting across me and, she's, and I was keeping on, this looks good, this looks good. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I do mixture modeling and, you know, the moment I have only two or three components, it's pretty tricky, you know, like variations will will have a big implement and if you have realistic mixtures it gets really tricky but once you have a lot of components in your mixture mixtures suddenly become pretty predictable pretty easy going so i have really good experience working with um mixtures okay despite they're complex and so when we now go from these mixtures of chemicals that we know to and i think i'm missing here a slide Oh, that's really strange. Oh, is it coming next? I'm sorry. I thought I'm getting out. I'm going out really quickly because I thought oh, I can also explain it here. So normally I have my iceberg mixture that probably most of you have seen already to um, explain the, I, I go out. I'll just show it quickly because I think um, it's for, if you're not familiar with this thinking, then it's too tricky. Sorry. Yeah, so is it the next slide? Oh, it's at the next one. I moved it the other way around. Oh, yes. Yeah, I see. How stupid is that? Slide. So I have to. This is what happens if you don't rehearse properly. Sorry for that. So I'm right back. Okay, so that's this iceberg model in some variation. You have um, probably all seen that. Um, where we basically say the, the known chemicals add up in mixtures and we can use this very simple concentration addition mixture model and we're using so-called bioanalytical equivalent concentration to express the mixture effect. That is a concentration of a reference compound that has the same effect as the mixture. So we can kind of give the mixture a nanogram per liter equivalent of, um, let's say, estradiol or so concentration. And then the, the total iceberg is what we measure in bioassays. And here we can also um, derive an, um, a bioanalytic concentration directly from the bioassay. And that's the effect concentration of this same reference compound divided by the effect concentration of the sample. And you get again, um, you get again um, um, the units of a reference compound. Then you can compare basically the known chemicals and the unknown chemicals and the unknown chemicals. Um, the BQ of the unknown chemicals is just um, the BQ of the known chemicals, what you measure, not of the known, uh, not of the known chemicals, of the BQ that you measure in your water sample, minus the BQ that you compute from the known chemicals. And so you can have a few scenarios. Um, you have here in gray the concentrations, in light gray the relative effect potencies, and so in blue then the BEQ for the individual chemical. We have here four chemicals. This is one that has a low concentration, low relative effect potency, so it has a moderate contribution to the mixture effect that we then just sum up. 
And this is a chemical that has even lower concentration, but high relative effect potency. So it seems to be a mix, mixture risk driver. And then we have a chemical with a high concentration, but low potency. So it's not as important, similar to, it has a similar contribution um, to, to um, the, the mixture effect as um, chemical one, even though it has much higher concentration. And then we have a chemical that has similar concentration as, as, as chemical one, but low potency, so we can forget about it. Then we sum up all the um, BEQs to the total BEQ chem, so the total mixture effect of the single chemicals. Um, and then the ideal scenario would be this, um, that the BEQ chem equals the BEQ bio, which means that we can explain all of the measured effect by the known chemicals. And that's often the case by very specifically acting compounds that are received receptor mediate that have receptor mediated effects and and one example is estrogenicity but for many of the other endpoints um and in our battery what i've been showing you was that it would be um the case for ahr for pipa gamma um for oxidative stress response there the bq unknown so the difference the gap is really big it can be um, um, 99 percent or more of that um, that unknown chemicals. And in practice, this looks like that. So for um, the mixture effects of hormone-like chemicals here for ER alpha, GR, AR, PR, they're all measured with um, the gene blazer test battery. Um, we can explain the effects quite well. Um, so we are within an order of magnitude between BQ bio and BQ chem. And what we are missing is typically a few chemicals that are below detection limit or just a few of the xenoestrogens, but we are within a factor of 10. And so um, we can basically say we understand the effect um, um, of the chemicals. And that's also in the majority of samples happening. There's really few samples where where we just um, we're missing out on on um, on um, some important mixture component. This is not the case. So here again, um, same type of plot: BQ Chem versus BQ Bio. Like in the slide before, here's still an, another example of an estrogenic response. And so you nicely on the one-to-one -one line. But when you then look at um, these other endpoints. Um, um, AHR, KLUX, PPR gamma, and oxygen stress response, we are by orders of magnitude away. So there's a lot of um, effect that we can't explain by the detected chemicals. Again, it makes sense because these are kind of less specific effects. More chemicals are active in these, in these endpoints. Um, and so it's quite natural that we have this gap. But it will give us some problems when you want to start the right effect-based trigger values. So just to round up the mixture effects, which are motivation for the derivation of, um, of um, effect-based trigger values. So now we have um, we basically have measured the mixture effects or the effects of the extract, and we have computed the effect of the known chemicals. We can, of course, do something in between, and we call that the tip of the iceberg. We can mix the chemicals in the concentrations as they are detected. And, um, and then actually measure them. And so that gives us also, again, a, a mixture effect. And we can compute it in two ways as a normal mixture with concentration addition, but we can also relate it to the initial water concentration and can then make this direct comparison. And so we did this with 227 of, of those mixtures. Um, that simulated realistic surface water samples that were quite diverse in their composition. And what was interesting that there's a few chemicals that, and but they were all small creeks in Germany. So they were rain event driven sampling. So in a way it's still one type of sample, but still within that one type, um, quite a bit of diversity. And so we had always a few chemicals that are important effect drivers. So um, contribute to 80% or 60 to 80% or even more to the overall effect. But what you also see, with this, these were um, 17 chemicals overall um, that um, I think these are more, but um, at the end we mix 17. But you also see that there are sometimes a chemical can be really high in, in, in one sample, but it, it's absent in most of the other samples. So there's really all sorts of um, 
possibilities that are happening here. And so what we then did, we did in these three essays um, that I've been mentioning now a couple of times, we compared the, um, the, the predicted um, PEQ, so the predicted mixture effects from the single chemicals and the one that we measured with the mixture of exactly these, these chemicals in the concentration ratios as we detected them. Um, these are totally 20, 227 points. There's a bit different numbers because sometimes it was just not possible to measure. Um, so we have um, most data are from AHRK LAX followed by PIPA and ARECE32. But the predictions are really beautifully fitting the experimental data. And these are not factor of 10 lines, what we often um, show, but this is a really a factor of two. So within a factor of two, um, the prediction matches the experimental data. So re, that's what we want to see for the panoramics mixtures too, hopefully, let's see. Um, so that was really nice and a very um, um, great demonstration. Um, and that really told us mixtures are important. We can't just derive effect-based trigger values for single components, but we need to account for mixtures. Okay, so when we... Um, Go into the development of effect-based trigger values. Um, there's different ways of doing it, and I've compiled that also in my beautiful little book. Or actually, Peter compiled everything, so you can you can actually um, get a lot of details. So I'm just um, showing you the the essentials today. Um, is that most groups are deriving effect-based trigger values from existing environmental quality standards. So they're, don't, they're not saying, oh, we have the fish swimming in the water or the, or the human drinking um, water, and they can take that much effect and then derive it. But they say, oh, there's so much chemicals, um, um, there's chemicals in the water and there's um, drinking water guidelines or in the environment, environmental quality standards. Um, and um, I start reading across from those, considering the mixture um, interactions, but we've already seen that concentration, addition, independent action is um, overlaying each other, um, is not different at low effect levels. So while we measure at high, higher effect levels to see something we, in the environment, we can always extrapolate down because when we drink water, we are not dying immediately. So the levels are really, really low. So we are safely be be below the 10% effect level. What's important is that the, for these effect-based trigger values to account for the mixture effects and why I don't have to explain to you, I just did. Um, they should be protected for both ecological and human health effects, but you can, of course, then go from drinking water guidelines as a um, point of departure or for from environmental quality centers. And then also bioassays that cover effects typically caused by chemicals that are known to occur in water. And that's kind of what I showed you with the test battery. Um, that's kind of the typical test battery where we see responses and we know what chemicals are causing them. And then the EBT derivation should preferably be based on a common method for all bioassays, encompass minimum numbers of steps and decision points, be anchored in experimental data, so not just um, modeling um, from the sky, and apply to epical endpoints and whole organisms as well as to specific in vitro assays. And boil down to the bare essential, they must be scientifically sound, rooted in practical experience, easy to apply to new data, robust and independent of judgment, and discriminatory and protective. That's a lot. And I think 2016, I pretty much spent doing 10 workshops in all capitals of Europe, um, plus Leipzig, um, and we're trying to find a common, common way of deriving effect-based trigger value, and it's not very easy. And even we now... Um, um, propose um, to, and this is a pretty crazy picture, I should have animated that, but I think I just run you through that. We, we now propose um, different, different approaches. There's just not, unfortunately, there's not one gold standard approach. For drinking water effect trace based trigger values, very often we go from the reference dose on the acceptable daily intake, look into water consumption, body weight, and then come to effect based trigger values. And you can basically add, make that a bit prettier by um, including in vitro to in vivo extrapolation and toxic kinetic considerations. You can also translate directly from a guideline value for a suitable reference compound. Then you're basically translating 
almost kind of back with how, how you had BEQ. The BEQ is the equivalent concentration of a reference compound. And then you can just take the reference compound, its guidance value, its guide, guideline value, and translate that back to in, in, uh, use that as BEQ and use that. That is a little bit um, challenging in practice, but of course, that's kind of the logic most straightforward way. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work, but it's used both for drinking water um, effect-based trigger values as well for surface water. We've proposed something to filter some of the data and why we need to filter, I will show you in a minute. Um, and so that we work with in vitro effect concentration as at guideline value concentrations and the relative effect potency in, in vitro. And then we can sometimes also apply a mixture factor for the chemicals where we know that mixtures will matter. Um, or we can even go via the critical membrane concentrations for baseline toxicity. So that's another <laughs> big thing that I can't explain to you in detail, but I, if you're interested, I have another at least three hour talk um, on this concept. But you can then go um, to the effect-based trigger values via these critical membrane concentrations and you look at specificity ratios um, um, and um, at, at, the, at mixtures this way. So all of those have been used to derive effect-based trigger value. And just one example, when you now look, for instance, only for estrogenicity, we, the effect-based trigger value is based on estradiol equivalent concentrations. Um, and the first thing what you see here is there's different values for different bioassays. And that's not all the bioassays there for estrogenicity. Some people say just read across from the EQS. Um, which is 0.4 nanogram per liter. EQS is the environmental quality standard in the water framework directive. So that holds for Europe, but just um, you probably have an equivalent value, value in the US. Um, and then you, but, but you see that basically the different assays have different sensitivity. And so they should actually be set um, at different stages. And some people have also derived effect-based trigger values for wastewater treatment plant effluent because that's basically where the estrogenicity comes from. What's puzzling at first stage is that most of the effect-based trigger values for human health and protection are lower, but that's just natural because fish are really impaired if they get some estrogens while humans produce it themselves. Um, and so what we see here, effect-based trigger values are bioassay specific and you need quite a bit of data underlying um, um, to um, derive them. And so what we did then as a next step, um, we went into the big databases um, to account for the mixture effects. And we looked at the TOX21 database. And that was all working really well when you don't, when you only look, for instance, for estrogenic chemicals, when you only look at um, the highly potent ones. And we have a concept here that's called baseline toxicity. So we have um, increasing effect with increasing hydrophobicity. We use here liposome water partitioning. Um, because this includes also ionizable chemicals, and that's basically the negative logarithm of cytotoxicity. So high number means high effect. And the experimental EC is in a certain distance, and that's the specificity ratio. So a, bit, a new concept maybe for some of you, but very useful for analysis. And so anything that's a baseline toxicant will just distribute around this specificity ratio of one, so on a log scale of zero. And then if and an essay that is like this one here, six orders of magnitude, more specific means we have highly specific endpoint and we call them now category one assays. And in reality, for estrogenic chemicals and just the estrogens, and that's not a good distribution, just a few data points, estrone, estrio, estriol, um, estradiol, and estenyl estradiol are the four points. Then your mean, or median SR baseline toxic uh, SR against baseline is um, 4 million. So really highly specific. And then I can ignore all the other chemicals. However, when I add the low potency ER agonists, then my picture is totally skewed. And these are um, bisphenols and phthalates and all sorts of environmental pollutants that are active in TOX21. So these are... Um, 10,000 chemicals, not all of them are active, but um, quite a large number is, is, is active. And then we unfortunately get a second distribution. And of course, once it's not as distinct um, with a very high potency um, estrogens, um, it's a bit hard to differentiate here. And so what we need to do 
we really need to filter out these low potency um, ER agonists because otherwise our our um, effect based trigger values are really totally off. And so these are um, the the assays that um, some assays that they don't have those really high potency chemicals. So that's for instance the chemicals that activate the oxidative stress response, they only have the distribution of the SR. Again, many, many chemicals. Um, this is ARE team blazer from TOX21 plus a few of our data points. Beautiful, so these are experimental data, beautiful normal distribution. And the median is, um, is only at a specificity ratio of eight, so only eight times more potent than baseline toxicity. And that's typical for, for many of the more apical endpoints um, so for those, we have to do something else. And yes, I've just seen this. And um, so when we now start to use uh, derive this, um, the effect-based trigger values, we can actually start with a baseline QSA and can basically say, well, the baseline toxicity QSA for all cell lines are very similar, and they all associate with the critical membrane concentration that is around 69 millimole per liter lip. I really regret to have put that value 69. 69, that was a median of one modeling exercise, but that's it, that it is now. So that's our angle. It could be 100, it could be 50, it doesn't really matter. And then we can basically say, how much baseline toxicity do we consider as safe? As safe? So minimal toxicity. So if we accept 1% of cytotoxicity as, as, um, as safe, um, then we have our original in our original water sample, then we would have this dose response curve cytotoxicity against enrichment of the water. And if you do this, then we derive um, a cytotoxicity effect based trigger values in form of an IC10 of a ref of 10 because it's a linear dose response curve. You might have to think about that a little bit slowly because it's <laughs> like you have to think a bit around the corner probably to, to, to really in ingest that. And with this, we can now start with the size of toxicity EBT. We then take the SR baseline. We've discussed that in detail for the ARE. Um, and um, you can also do that for other endpoints where you have different distributions. And then you just apply um, the, the SR, you divide the size of cytotoxicity EBT by the SR baseline, and then you get the effect-based trigger effect concentration. And then and again, because it's easier to pronounce and easier to feel what it means, we then translate that again into the EBT bioanalytical equivalent concentration, EBT PEQ, and these are the resulting numbers. So far, so good. But mostly, this is really data rich. Mostly, we don't have that much data. So what are we doing there? And here's, by the way, so you can get... Um, um, a copy of this, but it's also in the book. And the book is actually, you don't need to buy it. You can also um, download it, um, open access. You have long lists of those um, effect-based trigger values from different um, 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 groups. And so this is also in a, in a more recent paper, we have updated it again. So this is a summary. So just for you um, to, to, if you want to download the, um, the, um, the, the PowerPoint presentation. And this is how things look like. When we now apply these effect-based trigger values and compare that, this works here really well. Wastewater is way above EEQ um, in terms of estrogenicity. Even wastewater treatment effluent is not so good, but uh, the, those values up here are actually just primary treatment. And the few that have tertiary treatment down here are actually really good. Surface water is quite variable. And the, the study where we had um, the rainwater, uh, the rain... Um, Rain event triggered um, surface water sampling was actually quite scary because, you know, for many years we only worked at nice weather and then we're down here, but um, rain really remobilizes um, chemicals. For HR, we're usually fine, especially after wastewater treatment, the same for oxidative stress response. But we, it's really good now we have an anchor. Um, and we can now kind of, whenever you have a new data set, we put that into this plot more or less and um, see, you know, can benchmark not only studies against each other different regions in the world, but we can also, um, we can also compare between different water types here, wastewater, um, effluent, surface water, and surface water during rain events. And of course, these effect-based trigger values are for surface water, so they are just for comparison. What do we do if you have not enough data to derive EBTs? Um, there's an observation that actually Fred Luge made is that 
after I've been breaking my head in, with all my algorithms, and all these mixture considerations, he said, wait a minute, um, when you look at your current EBT that you have proposed, um, and, um, and then you realize that they are actually really close to the, to the um, um, effect concentration of, of the reference compounds we often use. And I said, well, they were just really good choosing these reference compounds. They're quite um, 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 active ones, but there's no relationship between the reference compound and the EBT. You know, like I, I've just shown you how I, we derived um, them and it's much, much um, more complicated. And then he kept on saying, but you know, I plotted them all and they look really good. And and again, um, this is now again a factor of 10, but everything seems to be within a factor of 10. Um, and so we basically said, well, let's be pragmatic for the many assays where we don't have enough single chemical data because the assays are not included in TOX, Tox 21. So we don't have 10,000 10, data points or even in TOX 21 and TOXCAS, not every essay has 10,000 data points. But we can now basically just derive the interims assay specific effect based trigger value by dividing the effect concentration of the assay reference compound by the median ratio of 5.8, which is the ratio for equal um, for, for surface water, and 0.7 um, for the human effect based trigger values. And so now our prediction works quite well. So um, that's a way out if you. Just and I've been using that now because you know you have a new essay and you don't really know and you don't have enough data to make to do all these mixture derivations. So that's quick, quick. I mean, that's nothing that ever gets into regulation, but that helps us um, get um, hang on to um, judging what does the value mean because otherwise the effect, you know, like if you say, oh, this water sample has 10% of this and this effect if you enrich it 35 times. That doesn't tell us anything, you know. We, we can only say what it means in terms of water quality if we compare to benchmark, i.e. if we compare um, to an effect-based trigger value. There's ideas what to do when an effect-based trigger value is, is exceeded. I'm, for time reasons, I'm not going to go through that plot, um, but that's also something as a group has been looking um, um, into during um, a project of the Global Water Research Coalition on effect-based methods in water safety planning. So, you know, what you do if the if there's an exceedance. Um, and um, with this, I would like to come to the end. Basically, I hope I showed you that um, effect-based trigger values are essential when using effect-based monitoring tools, because otherwise you just get random house numbers um, and that you can't interpret. Um, the mixtures effect need to be considered in the derivation of effect-based effect trigger values. Um, there remains a difficulty um, due to the lack of single chemical effect data and also single chemical guideline values from which we can read across. And so that's why we made this independent um, derivation that where I showed you quite a bit because that's the most recent one and that really kind of accounts for the mixtures. And despite all these limitations, the existing EBTs appeared quite robust and practically applicable. So we've been using them right, right left, um, um, and, and it's been working really well. And especially now with this interim um, way of, um, of um, getting effect-based triggers for data poor chemicals, I think we're quite well off. If I was too fast, you can read both of those books or actually just read the second one, um, which is open access. And um, we also have a, a few additional gadgets and talks and everything um, on this web page. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a few questions. We definitely have a few questions. So let me pull up our Q&A here. So thank you for that talk, by the way. It was really interesting and um i found myself regretting that you uh, we had invited you to our annual meeting back last october and um would have been great to have you but we had some scheduling issues but so thank you for for coming here and telling us all about this work and we'll get to the questions now so the first one is uh, way back in the beginning, you had a slide with the different assays, and someone is wondering about the rationale behind putting AHR 
in the toxicokinetics box only. Oh yeah, hi Magnus, <laughs> thanks for this question. <laughs> of course, that's a super simplified view. So that's kind of activation of enzymes that are of metabolic enzymes is kind of the main pathway, but we all know, of course, how much um, other indirect effects AHR activation is responsible for. And that's probably the reason why we why we assess AHR as, as one of the endpoints, and but it doesn't mean anything that I put in that box. That was just a very, very simplified picture. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, they're wondering how we could consider unknown chemicals that are present in the water in the work that you're presenting or the, in the EBT model. I mean, that's what we do. So we derive the EBTs from known chemicals with these consideration, but then they hold for those unknown mixtures. And so they hold for those effects that we directly measure in the water samples or in the extracts of the water samples. So they account for the mixtures. Okay. Um, <laughs> are mixture factors for deriving EBTs really needed if mixture effects tend to be predictable? Yeah, so the, the mixture factors is really one of the ways of doing it. Um, and was really in 2016. So you, you weren't really in this in these groups yet on water quality, uh, Magnus. You came in a bit later, but we had everybody around Norman, and we had one workshop after the other. And at the end, we couldn't come up with one way of doing it, and and we broke kind of the the the, the challenge by by um, adding mixture factors. But it it I never liked it, you know. So. Um, it just always felt like yeah, we know so much, we have to find another way. And so what I presented now in a bit longer way with the distribution of the specificity ratios, that was a way of, um, of um, um, accounting for mixtures more specifically and not using um, a mixture, mixture factor because these mixture factors were really justified by me because out of despair after six workshops and no conclusions, we really wanted to get this paper out and we really wanted to kind of propose something that would be workable. And it's 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 not easy because there's really um there's really a lack of data. And of course the in, in, in mind the quality standards um have not been picked in mind that somebody later comes and uses them for deriving mixture effect based trigger values. And so there was um a lot of um, 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 data um, gaps and then the, this additional complication of the very high potency, and low potency components. So that the story is, is now, it's not even a super smooth story, you know, like when I re, I'm retelling it again, I feel like, oh, yeah, it's, it's not so, it's not a smooth story, you know, it's not a lot story you like to tell, um, but um, that was just the reality. And so, so um, and what I also showed you at the beginning is with these mixtures, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we don't need mixture assessment factors also in, in chemical risk assessment because, there's only a few chemicals that dominate the mixture effect, but even those, just these experiments with the 227 mixtures showed us, yes, there's often one or two chemicals that dominate, but it's not predictable, predictable which ones they are. They're not always the same ones, yeah? It really depends on occurrence and potency, and these are absolutely random. Um, they're not connected. Um, and they're a little bit connected. Sucralose is not very toxic and it's very abundant. If it was toxic, we wouldn't use it so much and it wouldn't be that abundant. So there's even there's a little bit of connectivity. But normally there's not there's no associate, there's no mechanistic association. And that makes these things so 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 difficult. And so a mixture factor is always an act of despair, I would say. So it was a total act of despair for me in the when I derived the effect-based trigger values. And I think what the European Union now does for the with this big discussion, I'm not sure if all of the US um, have followed that, but there's a big discussion in Europe if we should introduce a mixture assessment factor in the in the regulation. And a lot of people are against it, a lot of people are, are for it, but at the end, it is just a factor that acknowledges that chemicals act together in mixture and the mixture effect can be higher than the effect of a single chemical. So it's kind of a safety factor. The moment you accept that as such, then you can, it doesn't really matter how big it is. It's kind of an additional safety factor. Yeah, I, I was kind of reminded about the conversation <laughs> about safety factors and uncertainty factors and, mm. you know, 
the discussion about should we be adding an in vitro to in vivo 10x factor etc so mm -hmm. um all right we have a, a few more questions let's see how many we can get to um so somewhat sort of a double question here but they say thanks for an excellent presentation so we'll get that compliment out of the way and they're wondering, uh, is the assumption that mixtures in general behave under concentration or dose addition as opposed to independent action? And at what level of a mode of action or AOP are you determining similarity across mixture component chemicals at the MIE or somewhere further downstream? It doesn't really matter. So I think that's where the history started at MIE with dioxin-like chemicals. That's how this concept also of B TEQs back then, we call it now BEQs because we look at effects and you know, toxicity started. And the whole TEQ, BEQ concept is based on concentration addition. And these considerations I've showed you in my first slides basically say, we don't need to worry about the difference between concentration addition and independent action. And then people can still say, oh, but we might need to worry about antagonism synergy. And I have touched that here but that would be yet another big talk. Um, but again, the more component, the less likely is that um, um, antagonism or synergy play a role in the overall mixture effect. It's really important when you formulate a pesticide, when you have a binary mixture and one is an enhancer of the other or something like that, but it's not relevant when you go to a mixture with um, hundreds and or thousands of components. And so we don't need to make a mixture assumption. And that's something I, I know we have many projects in, in human health risk assessment. We have these common assessment groups and all of that. From my perspective, working on low concentration mixtures in water, and water is not as thick as blood, but you know, basically you have the same thing in, in, in the blood, is it's all nonsense. We can just all safely use concentration addition. It's also a little bit, you know, we're making life more difficult for us in that we say, oh, it's too difficult, we can't predict it because of synergy antagonism and concentration um, independent action. Um, and But we have to realistically as, uh, um, see how far we are away. I mean, we're happy if we predict something with an order of magnitude in, in toxicology or repeat something within a factor of two, and we're safely in these mixture prediction within a factor of two. So simplifying it to the bare bones of just using concentration addition, which means that we can use the BEQ or TEQ in the old days um, concept um, works really well. And then going from the dioxins then to estrogens and, you know, initially everything was on molecular initiating event, but then people got braver and looked more integrative all the way to in vivo effects and it still worked. Just practically it works. Um, and I think it works just because um, a lot of these processes are stochastic and so they are just additive on a, on a log scale. And so that's why things work really well. So we don't need to make our life too difficult. I And, and I must say, I don't understand. I mean, I've now so published uh, so much on this, but people still don't believe it. You know, they also tell me, I don't believe in baseline toxicity, but you know, it's real. We find it all the way. Um, and so it's not a thing about believing, but you have to look at the data and then you have to really stick, step back and say, oh yes. We never have more than 10% in our water unless there's an accident, you know, so we can safely work on those low effect assumptions and we can give a lot of experimental evidence. We don't know what's happening at 0. 0.000 something percent. Also, I can't measure that. Yeah, nobody can measure that. But we have so much evidence not from 80, 90% effect where things got very nonlinear and um, very um, awkward, but we know quite a bit now what happens between, let's say, 5 and 15% that we can make pretty robust um, assumptions. So I'm pretty confident, but I'm also sitting on a lot of data that may give me a lot of confidence. So my confidence is really rooted in data. I like theoretical consideration, but I really like to have data. And, and I'm not sitting on it and hiding it, but I published everything and, and other people have too. And so um, I think it, we, we, I mean, there's still gaps. There's always too close. There's always more, more research to do, but um, in my view, mixtures are solved. Yeah. We can still run a few more. <laughs> to get more experience. Maybe sometimes you find a magic um, exception. So far, I haven't hit that. Normally, when I find the exception, there might be a pipe. There was often a piping error. There was something in the calculation um, 
that's a bit flawed or it's not relevant you know like if it's if it's a, it, yeah so another question is if ebts are applicable and if so to what extent for petroleum or petrochemicals and uvcbs i think that's where they where the concept would really lend itself really well um so you would have to have a reference compound, a good reference compound represented for this group. But then the, the nice thing is you don't need to resolve your um, unknown mixture, but you, you have basically a level that you can say, I accept that much activation of real hydrocarbon receptors or kind of the typical um, endpoints. And um, I can also do that with um, with chemicals, where uh, with mixtures um, that, that I have no idea what the composition composition is with water accommodate fractions, um, yeah, with everything. Okay. Um, someone's asking for maybe a, a clarification of a comment you made about SOT. Is there going to be a workshop on this topic at next year's SOT? I'm not sure if there's a workshop, but I know Peter Neal will present a similar talk, probably much better than me, <laughs> but she just told me that um, she is, um, she's been invited to SOT, but I don't know the details. Maybe I should have asked, but she's well, certainly attending and looking very much forward to, <laughs> to go. Well, we can always look them up mm -hmm. um, and find out. So um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, let's, let, why don't we go ahead and end on this one? I, there's a few questions from Magnus and I assume you know each other and that you can, um, get together afterwards, um, but we'll go with this one. Uh, he's asking, talk about the regulatory future for EBTs. You said a little bit about this, other matrices other than water. I'm also wondering, um, uh, you know, in, in my world, formulation testing, um, things like that for pesticides or products. It, do you think these approaches could be used for either a other matrices or other types of uh, products? Yeah, definitely. So where we're working right now in panoramics in this European Union project that Ray Wingard is um, heading, we are looking at application of effect-based tools in human biomonitoring, so in serum and blood. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you always hear it even more pronounced, you have a lot of endogenous compounds that give you an, a background. And so to measure an effect in blood doesn't mean that we are all dead in, in, a, in, a, in a short time, but we have to find, you know, the balance between endogenous and exogenous compounds. And so we do have a work package in that European Union project um, that is um, concerned with that. I had hoped by the, you know, I, we talked about me coming here for a very long time that I had already first glimpses in this direction, but it's really tricky. So really struggling with these endogen, endogenous compounds and this and that. And I mean, what I've shown you in the water quality field, that's really work that um, took a lot of my personal time, actually, I must say, since I think we started that 2010, 11. Um, and and I think that's it's also the worst. Don't read the series, young students. Don't read the series of papers because I'm constantly um, I'm changing my mind more or less, or like depending on. And I've been working with a lot. It's all a team effort. So I it sounds like I did it, but um, so I have a lot, lot of the concepts I develop, but it's always been discussed with a, with big teams of people, also from practice and so on. And it's really challenging. And so there's no clear cut one solution like you'd like to have. So it it um, it really builds up on. But we are making now the first steps um, in human biomonitoring. And while this is more complex as a matrix and 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 to honor the, the, the variability of the endogenous compounds activity and all of that. And I'm sure the test battery of of um, of um, um, of bioassays will be greatly reduced because some will just only pick up endogenous compounds. But I think we can learn, you know, if we learn from what the, all the experience we had with water, I think we can um, we can progress that. So I'm optimistic that we yeah, will be able to understand mixtures in human biomonitoring much better in the future. And then at the end, that also means we need to get an effect-based trigger value to say, you know, now and it, now an intervention is necessary. Now somebody has exceeded um, 
something we see an association with um, a health outcome. And so now we have to see how we can manage their health, how we can get them out of a certain exposure environment or something like that. That hasn't been thought all the way through, but I think it's the next really cool challenge um, to take. And thanks very much, Magnus. You're always spot on with your questions. <laughs> Well, that's all we have time for today. Uh, so thank you so much, Professor Escher, for joining us. Thank you all uh, out there on the webinar for joining us. Um, thanks to Allison Martin for her behind the scenes support. And um, we will see you a little later this month for our next webinar. Thanks very also much. Also very highly recommended. I just saw yours talk. Um, um, she rehearsed it in public and it's really great. <laughs> so great. go be there. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.